for the due, uh, let me give you a quick session guidelines for all of you. Make sure you are prepared, your laptop is charged, uh, chat responsibly, and be presentable when we're taking a good picture and be respectful to others. So for the Q&A session, we'll have it through Slido as we are doing from yesterday. Please scan the QR code from the screen uh, as we're showing, and then you can post your questions at the end of the session, speaker sharing. Right, so once three of the speakers shared, you can post your questions, and please indicate to which speaker you are indicating your question to. So let me introduce the moderator for this session. Uh, Dr. Jitesh Kumar from Thales University, Malaysia, will be moderating the session on the topic. And over to you, Dr. Jitesh, and the floor is yours. You can take away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupam. Am I audible? Is... Um, we, we cannot hear you, Dr. Jitesh, now. We can hear you, Dr. Jitesh. Go ahead. Right. I believe my voice is fine, right? Uh, still no. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we are here at the last session of the second day for the CRIT Summer School. Session is sharing economy and sustainable tourism development. Before I introduce about our three great speakers who will be talking about this particular theme, let me give some idea of what exactly it is. The tourism sharing economy applies the latest technological application to monetize access capacity and to provide ease of access to tourism resources. This concept is introduced on the idea of collaborative consumption, which emphasizes the importance of access rather than ownership. We have a three speaker who will be sharing uh, on this particular topic. Let me introduce the very first speaker of session of this particular session, Dr. Mingming Cheng. Dr. Mingming Cheng is an associate professor in digital marketing and the director of social media research lab in the School of Management and Marketing at Curtin University, Australia. Mingming is an award-winning researcher and educator with an international reputation in digital marketing and tourism. He is best known by his highly cited work on sharing economy and social media analytics. Further information can be found on, on his own website, www.mingmingcheng.com. And the topic for his presentation is the sharing economy and UN sustainable goals, where we are now and how we move further. Thank you so much, Dr. Mingming, for being with us. I'm sure you will be having wonderful uh, sharing session and it will be enlightening most of us. Thank you. Floor is yours, Dr. Mingming. Um, thank you very much. Let me now share my screen. Um, uh, continue, um, yes, I'm going to share my screen. Just give me a second. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, um, sorry, I'm going to find Um, Let me show you whether you can hear me. Can you, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and your oh. your presentation is also visible. Okay, cool. Um, hi, hi everyone. Thank you very much for attending today's session on a sharing economy and we and the UN Sustainable Goals. As, as you can tell from the way I speak, I'm gonna very excited. Not only because I know there's so many of you want to learn something new, but also the topic that I'm really excited about that I have been researching the last five years. And I found so many interesting things that are happening, but we don't know enough. So for today's topic, I'm going to talk about the sharing economy and the UN Sustainable Goals. Where are we now and how we move forward? Now, first and foremost, I would like to thank Taylor University for organizing this wonderful summer school. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate our tourism research, but also see how we can move forward. Now, before I, so before I start, I want to ask you a few things. So when you are thinking of the sharing economy, now, what in your mind? Now, of course, many of you will think, oh, you know, Airbnb and Uber. Of course. So these are the leading sharing economy platform has a disrupted the way how, we, how tourism practice has been um, offered in the last decades, but also at the same time challenge a lot of theories 
that's in the tourism industry. So what I will do is like, I wanna give you very, very brief introductions of what is the sharing economy business model, which uh, I think the other two speakers will tell you a bit more. Now, the concept of the sharing economy is that there is a digital platform that is for peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So in the, if you look at the pictures on the left side, it is basically, basically saying that, well, Airbnb is a middleman. And Airbnb can like the host who have underutilized accommodation to the tourists or the visitors. So the visitors will pay a fee to Airbnb for commission. And then the host will also uh, pay a fee for Airbnb. So Airbnb basically collect money from both sides. But the fundamental thing of the sharing economy is that it's a digital platform that connecting peer to peers. So I just want to give you a, a very, very brief pictures of people's interests over the years. So the blue ones is Airbnb and the red one is Uber. As you can see that Uber and Airbnb enjoy really, really rapid growth in the last decades. But you can see a lot of fluctuations. Now, particularly you see the, the interest for Airbnb has dropped significantly in the last two years, now mostly because of COVID. But also you'll be wondering why Uber has also dropped. Now, if you look in the sharing economy more broadly now, like for Uber, so it also has a lot of competitors in the market. We have Ola, we have Chinese DD. They are, they are competing. So the interest of Uber had dropped significantly. So, by looking at this, like Airbnb and Uber, that's the image what we usually get when, it, when we talk about the sharing economy. Now, Airbnb will tell you, look, you have a spare apartment and you should put on Airbnb and you can earn enough money and you decorate that. So it's a before and after. Uber will tell you, look, don't worry about taxi. We are cheaper as well as we will have an advanced GPA system that we can locate you so easily. So, this people are really, ex we are really excited because there's so many benefits that the sharing economy can bring us. So it will say, look, you know, you, we just prioritize utilization, accessibility of underutilized goods and services over ownership. So because we are utilize underused resources, people's spare rooms, spare cars, it can actually save resources and reduce carbon emission. And Airbnb even said to everyone, look, you know, we promote um, more efficient use of existing resources and it's a more environmentally sustainable way to travel than a traditional accommodation. So people are really excited. But later on, we are starting the questions. Well, it seems that the sharing economy business model, like Airbnb and Uber, definitely will contribute to sustainable development goals. But now people start questioning, is that the real case? So let me give an example here. Now, because people have saved money through using Airbnb, the Airbnb is cheaper. So people now, for the, for the actual money they have, they travel more frequently, they stay longer, visit the places that are further away, or simply explore holiday houses in nearby suburbs. So how they use the money? So how the, man, the, the money they saved for tourists through Airbnb, how it will be reused? Now, for Airbnb hosts, for example, they're going to expand the actual rental income. So how they spend the actual rental incomes will actually make differences. And that's what we call induced consumptions. And our research will tell you, this induced consumptions can significantly change dynamics in our business environment and, and also how the, country, how the sharing economy contributes to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, people were saying, look, Airbnb is saying 
Airbnb is doing a great job being environmental friendly. But Airbnb being more sustainable is largely assumed rather than empirically tested. Now, green cred, um, creden, cre, uh, credentials comes from Airbnb. So if they're interested to pro, promote a green image, Airbnb also claim that the users are actually are all environmental friendly users. And the environmental, their, their product service are more environmental friendly. So it's all come from Airbnb. And then Airbnb will further saying that, well, Airbnb, for example, you know, saying, well, if you are using Airbnb, we like the result significant amount of emissions by 2025. Now, this is all looking like that. Wow. Actually, people questioning, but Airbnb and Uber said we're doing good. So if we look at here, this is what a DD present at, a, at a international conferences. DD said to everyone, by the way, DD is similar to Uber, is also part of the sharing economy. Well, DD will tell everyone, no, we contribute a lot to the UN sustainable de sustainable de de developer goals. No poverty, gender equity, decent work, industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and a community and a climate action. And if you look at right, so how they frame it? So they will say, well, because DD provide 21 million flexible job opportunities and 33.93 million were those left traditional industry and 1.3 million are for zero income family. That's what I say, it helped deal with the poverty. And it was saying, oh, look at the people who doing DD, 2 million women get job opportunities. So it contributes gender equity. And DD were further saying that if you look it down on your right, it was better future because of a job of the children, because people can go flexible work, they can actual income. Because DD also provide finance and insurance, they also provide auto maintenance benefits. So they will say we'll also provide cell phones to make you safe, and we'll contribute to smart cities because we'll provide data to the transport organizations or agencies for the government. Well, this all looks like, you know, this is really great. But the issue is that many of the statements that this sharing economy contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals are not based on the evidence. A lot of them are observations or opinion or simply the research conducted in the black box of the sharing economy businesses. So what we did in the last five years is that we do a lot of things. We want to say, well, if a sharing economy is all that are good, but why are people still questioning? So we do a lot. We say we do an interview with the key stakeholders. We understand with the popularities of the Airbnb will actually reduce the sense of belongings or sense of communities. And we also say Airbnb saying Airbnb is so environmentally friendly. But we say, how let's calculate the carbon footprint. And also we're looking at Airbnb is a platform, but also it introduced what we call the digital discriminations. And then we're also looking at algorithmic management, how Airbnb using algorithm to manipulate uh, the, the gas house relationship between Airbnb and other stakeholders. And then we're also looking at um, how Airbnb hosts help each other um, you know, during difficult time and AMB we rate requirements, finance performance. So I'm gonna roughly tell you um, each project we have been done. Now, AMB and you say, well, it will environment friendly. Now, so what do we do? We're looking at Australia. If you think of these figures, four percent of Australian housing stock has been used by Airbnb. And Airbnb claim we contribute a lot. If you look at the figures here. Airbnb basically listings are everywhere. And this is what you think while well, your experience at Airbnb is always green. 
but Airbnb with such numbers, it has the, it is now bigger than the world top of five hotel brands put together. And a lot of things come from Airbnb are saying that we are better than hotels and we are greener. But our research find different things. And one, one thing I talked about a bit earlier is that induced consumptions. Now, when Airbnb, when we talk about consumptions, we have direct, indirect, and induced. Now, induced consumption means that Airbnb hosts are likely to respend any extra income on, on different goods and services in better serving the customers and improving our living standards. So we then use the input on two models and then we follow the income group each different groups. And then we say how the, the actual income will be respent. So what do we do? We say if the Airbnb host, if with the behavior as usual, so how this actual income will be, actual income will be spent. And then we talk about on average. So if they do a bit of investment, how much carbon footprint they would produce, and we talk the best and the worst scenarios. So what do we found out is that really, if we calculate the induced carbon emissions, Airbnb probably, probably Airbnb will produce probably even higher carbon emissions. So let me give an example here. Now, if we include the induced consumptions for Airbnb, it was saying that if we do average saving and investment as, an, as everyone do in a society, and many people do in a society on average, then stay one night at Airbnb in Sydney is similar to the to drive um, to drive a few wheel vehicles from Sydney to Wollongong. So similar amount of carbon emissions will be produced. Now, if we look at the worst cases, what we can see that if you spend one night at a big house in Sydney, the carbon emissions can be like you take a flight from Sydney to Auckland. It's actually very significant. So what do we find that? Well, most tourist accommodation does not, regardless whether it is Airbnb or traditional hotel accommodation, it comes with a sizable greenhouse emission. And the Sustainable Host Hospitality Alliance suggests that. Now, hotel need to reduce 90% if we want to reach um, the Paris Agreement. So the same applies to Airbnb. So if we look, if, what do we research? We found that if Airbnb produce such a significant amount of carbon emission, similar to hotels, that Airbnb also need to reduce its carbon emissions. But now we don't know. So the other thing we talk about is that for the hotels, so we don't know how hotel induced consumption is. So at this stage, we know that if we plus direct, indirect, and induced consumptions, Airbnb is significant in term carbon emission. But also another thing was quite interesting is what we call a carbon equity. So the actual income respond will probably widen the social, social economic gaps and form new social carbon in inequity. And also, um, we, what we did is on Sydney, so we don't know what about global evidence, and we don't know what the policy intervention are. So this is what we show you is the carbon food Gini index. What we show that is that based on the work we're doing for different groups, if we based on estimations, we're going to widen the social economic gaps. So those are people who have properties on Airbnb, a multiple, multiple, they're more likely to have better, um, they have they can use actual income for, for improving their life and spending on actual services. So this will actually widen the gaps of our society. Now, the second research project we are doing is what we call the vulnerabilities of the sharing economy. So I'll give an example here. If you look at picture here, it's Western Sydney, lots of AME listings. And if you look at Perth in the city center, it's a lot as well. I think this is not a single case. It's happened everywhere around the whole world. Now, 
The popularity of Airbnb we talked about earlier is that people saying it's good value for money. Airbnb located in city center or in residential areas is convenient and it create home feelings. And also it ha can do have household amenities. For example, you can cook, you maybe have swimming pools, maybe you even have pet amenities. And you know what happens? Because Airbnb, so many people are using Airbnb as a tourist, and people start realizing that, realizing that, well, if I only have one property and take care of it and I put it in the market, I can have enough money that work normally as, as a scientist. So basically, if you we look at the purse here, so if you only put you two bedroom apartment in the market, so only you only need a one week that you can earn the whole amount for the whole month if you put on long term rental. So what happens? A lot of people say, "Well, Airbnb, those Uber things can help me make a lot of profit. You know, I have great income. I don't need to do any other jobs." Well, this seems good. But the real problem come in. Now, because a lot of people who put Airbnb, uh, who put their properties on Airbnb, and a lot of people, a lot of places, particularly in regional areas, then it makes people hard to find a long-term rental in local communities, particularly in regional areas. A lot of people will feel like, now we have so many Airbnb listings, and we don't want to stay here. We want to leave. So it creates so much problem for the uh, problems. And then we're also looking at Airbnb while not competing on the same ground with the hotels. So we're looking at saying, for example, the lead, so for the five hotel star, five hotel, uh, five star hotels, they have they need to have smoke detectors, they need to have uh, you know, fire, uh, they need to have lock on the bedroom door, a first aid kit. But Airbnb is not required. So they're not competing on the same ground. But sometimes hotel will say, you know, that's okay. As long as we have enough occupancy rate, we don't care. But the reality is COVID told us or not. Since COVID, bad things happened. Now, people in, in, the, in, the, in 2020, when we have a strict lockdown across the whole world, like Airbnb hosts are varied. Now, what are the future of Airbnb? So this is what we did for 42 global cities. You can see some in some cities like Airbnb, um, Airbnb listing have jobs very significant. They can drop, you know, they can drop nearly 100%. And then we do across different cities. We can see a significant job. So, Airbnb hosts wants to think, you know, I only want to do Airbnb or I only want to do Uber. So, yes, this kind of job creates flexibility to have control over the financial and the personal aspect of work. And Airbnb hosts are free to decide when they want to put a property on the market, but whereas hotel employees cannot, or hotel simply cannot. But, when COVID come in, like in Australia, the Australian government told all the Airbnb hosts saying, well, unfortunately, you are not part of the former economy. Now you are not entitled to employment insurance, worker compensation and disability insurance. And I'm very sorry you had to deal with yourself. And what is that, do they get some help from Airbnb? Well, Airbnb say, oh, look, we want to help you. So if people, if you have experienced uh, COVID-19 conservations, and then they were saying, look, but what do we do? We only count the booking before a particular date. And then they're also saying we have provided a super host relief fund. But they're only to the host who shows strong reliance on Airbnb as a vital source of income. However, only some super hosts can act a benefit. So 
when when bad things happen, you rely on Airbnb. Airbnb probably offer very little. The government say we don't want to help you too. So what what would you do? So if you Airbnb host, if you rely on that extra income to make ends meet, including you paying your mortgage and the renting stay in your home, you're in trouble. And many Airbnb hosts who heavily rely on Airbnb as a vital source of income can be really difficult. So let me give you um, the figures we got in Sydney. So basically from January 2020 to January uh, to August 2020, the pandemic has made Airbnb hosts lost nearly 90% incomes. And in Sydney alone, in January, it have 12,000 Airbnb listings, but in August, it only have 2,000. So we see a, actually an 80% drop. So you can see particularly the entire home drop significantly. And then you can see in different suburbs and how the listings are gone. So you will see that the people who rely on Airbnb, they, are, they can really have significant consequences on the suburbs where they live in. But the things we see that Airbnb are dropping, but then they're also recovering very quickly. So if your Airbnb regional area demonstrate more resilience and recover more quickly than in the cities. And Donica, Donica, Donica predict that, you know, some professional hosts will likely to decline into a long-term rental, but our figures didn't really see that. So the reason why AMB bounced back so quickly is because AMB host does not need to spend, AMB does not need to spend a large amount of money on the cost associated with upkeep of fixed assets. AMB is saying, if anything happens, any risk happen, AMB host, you deal with it. The property owner, you deal with it. It only it will return the prof profitable parts of a business to face disruptions. So. What about the part? So what are, you can see that Airbnb, if tourism is going is doing great, Airbnb will be happy to work with you. But if something bad happened, Airbnb host, you will deal with it. Airbnb offer support is limited. The government support is limited. So there's a lot of policy implications. Now, how they should be regulated? Does Airbnb play is a fair bit? Airbnb host a right obligation complying with safety standards. So, but at the end of the day, Airbnb is still not willing sharing their data. So what we can see is here, Airbnb has so many benefits, but it can also produce inequity and carbon footprint. So this is what we do if anyone is interested. We're looking at what are positive impacts and negative impacts of the sharing economy. So against different sustainable development goals. So, what are the key takeaways from our research? Now, we have started to see the fully pictures of the sharing economy, but they are more needed to, down, to be done to quantify the real impact of the sharing economy. It's not always about great things. It's all the things that Airbnb hosts are suffering. For example, they, would you regard Airbnb hosts or Uber driver as a decent work? So we put a question mark from our research. So, but however, the sharing economy, it is a part of the digital disruptions in tourism. And when you tap into its potential, but reduce its negative impacts. So if you want a further reading, you can um, see some of the articles we have been doing. And that's pretty much for me, from, from me saying where we are now and how we move forward from the sharing economy and how we can make the best of it to contribute to UN Sustainable Development Goals. And if you love the presentation, and don't forget to give five-star reviews like Airbnb. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ming Ming. Actually, it was wonderful sharing about uh, Airbnb. And uh, the most important thing which I... Uh, got from your presentation that we must have more properties but shouldn't rely on that property because that's a secondary income probably 
So uh, we have a few questions, but we will take those questions at the end of uh, this session after the rest two presenters are done with their presentation. So thank you so much once again, Dr. Ming Ming. And uh, now thank let you. me introduce uh, the second speaker of the session, Associate Professor Dr. Richard Robertson. Richard joined the Dr. Richard joined the University of Queensland in 2005 after a career as a chef. He has taught undergraduate and postgraduate courses in hospitality and tourism management and professional development. His teaching and learning expertise and scholarship are recognized by awards and advisory appointment at state, national, and international levels. He was conferred his PhD investigating the mobility and motivation of chef in 2011. His research projects largely adopting a critical positionality with many nationally and internationally funded, explore tourism and hospitality workforce policy and planning, skill development, hospitality foodies, consumer behavior, and designing and evaluating the education programs. He currently holds an advanced Queensland industry research fellowship to develop a tourism workforce crisis, resilience and recovery strategies. Thank you so much, Dr. Richard Robertson for being with us. And the floor is yours. Um, thank you. We should say the screen is mine, right? Um, do I um, do I have audio with everybody and visual and the PowerPoint's running? Could I just get a thumbs up, please? Yes, it's great. Yes. It, it's all working. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, this has been very nicely themed by the organisers, and I would like to, again, thank Taylor's University for the invitation to speak today and this wonderful initiative in its second iteration today uh, that makes um, the, the expertise and knowledge of so many um, scholars publicly available through this um, type of forum. Um, uh, Dr. Ming Ming has, has warmed them us, warmed them us up really well because I'm actually kind of taking a critical perspective on the sharing economy as well. Um, and actually there'll be some uh, common themes in my presentation today um, with that that you've um, just heard. <clears throat> and, and that's actually uh, a really good thing, actually. Um, so um, let me begin. I'm going to firstly acknowledge the country on which I am speaking here. This is a Australian protocol where we respect um, the first Australians, the original custodians of the land on which I'm speaking today. Um, in fact, the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. Um, and I'd like to pay respects to their ancestors, past and present. Um, who continue to um, look after the land on which um, I live and work and recognise their contributions to Australian society. Um, I'd like to start off by um, uh, presenting an outline of what I'm going to speak today. I'm not going to spend too much on um, the sharing economy. I think um, Dr Ming Ming has set the scene for that a little bit, um, as well as speaking about the three key uh, dimensions of um, sustainability. Um, I'm also going to talk today about the impacts of the sharing economy on three key um, tourism domains, travel, accommodation, food service, and offer a bit of a critical review of those. And um, at the end of the presentation, we can draw our own conclusions about how this links to sustainable tourism development. Um, this might seem a little bit self-indulgent, but I think something that's highly neglected in the academic community is that we as researchers fail to disclose our positionality or where it is that we come from. And that's really important because the topics we choose to research, the way we research them, uh, the way we communicate them is deeply impacted by who we are, where we come from, and the way we, um, um, <clears throat> um, the values that we hold. Um, I, I'm English by birth and um, I migrated to Australia with my family when I was 10 years old. And I was actually deeply shocked when we stopped in South Africa where this photograph's taken, um, when it was deep in apartheid and I saw signs like blacks only and whites only. And I found this very difficult to comprehend. And this has actually informed who I am as a person and my, my social sensibilities, I guess. 
Um, this is not a um, this is not a um, fancy dress party. I actually spent um, eighteen years um, as a chef in industry, and as such, I have real skin in the game. I have had real skin in the game in terms of being a tourism operator, tourism employee, as well as now a, a tourism and hospitality researcher. I moved to the academic sector um, uh, nearly twenty years ago now and um, taught, but increasingly I've become what I would call a um, workforce-focused critical scholar. And uh, a lot of the work I do now is sort of standing up for some of the social rights and the issues of um, workers in our economy, um, their, their rights. Um, can I close this? I'm going to close that. Good. Um, their, their rights, their treatment, fair work principles, um, well-being, uh, mental health and and so on um, and some of my publications have this flavor as well where I um, investigate um, fair work principles like wage theft um, the existence of slavery <clears throat> um, and its coexistence with hospitality and tourism services and increasingly this idea of critically examining um, sustainability um, and its relationship with employment. So that's a little bit of my background and I hopefully it gives a flavour for my positionality and the lens that I'm going to apply today. Um, Dr Ming Ming did a good job of um, defining the sharing economy, so I'm going to um, not go into that um, too deeply. But what I would like to quickly share is that the origins of the sharing economy were exactly that. They were about sharing commodities um, without them being transactional. So there were phenomena like couch surfing, where you would certain you would list a room for free um, for somebody that was travelling, and you wouldn't expect them to pay. They might bring a bunch of flowers, or they might contribute to dinner. But the idea is that um, you wanted people to, to to share a resource that you had. Similarly, um, there were apps that um, if you were driving from Brisbane to Sydney and you had a spare seat you would invite somebody to join you with no expectation that they would contribute. Of course, they could voluntarily. However, the sharing economy has really been appropriated um, a, a, as a business model and started to be dominated by platforms and a huge uptick in services since the um, since the 2000s. However, the way that it's been appropriated in business has led to um, a, a great deal of ambiguity or misunderstanding about what the term sharing economy actually means and it's and it's labeled with many different um, terms which i'm not going to read out to you it's also often confused with the circular economy which it has no relationship with really and many scholars um, going back quite some time now have actually criticized the sharing economy as a mix, misnomer or an oxymoron indeed because there's not a lot of sharing going on but it's simply an access economy and this is exemplified by some of the um, examples that Dr Ming Ming gave before for example hoteliers simply using Airbnb as another distribution channel or negative um, gearing property investors um, using it as a funding model to invest and 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 grow their property portfolios. Um, so with that background, I'd like you to, you're all very familiar with this model, so I don't need to talk about it. The text is unimportant. What is important is the colour coding here. So I'd like you to remember this, environmental green, economic blue and social red, because I'd now like to go on and speak about how some of the um, sharing economy um, sectors in tourism, what their track record is from a critical point of view here. So um, the first one and probably the first one that entered the market was travel. Um, uh, Dr. Ming Ming introduced us to Didi, I think, uh, and there's a whole um, lot more here, depending on where you come from. There are probably more um, there. However, the, the, the whole premise behind the sharing economy when it came to introducing models like Uber is that it would actually reduce car ownership because we would actually be able to share in other people's resources. Well, the evidence is that in, um, in cities that um, have a high level of saturation of um, uh, platform sharers like, like Uber, Ola, et cetera, there's um, an increase um, in car ownership. Um, 
they have also the, the 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 myth was also that they would lead to reduced traffic and um, reduced traffic congestion, but this has turned out not to be the case. Um, in uh, again in in saturated cities, there's a um, three percent um, increase in traffic and traffic congestion, and um, measurable um, <clears throat> increases in carbon emissions um, up to. Um, uh, which um, Dr. Mingling spoke about as well, actually. Um, one of the very negative and unintended consequences is that it actually takes commuters away from sustainable forms of transport, like public transport, with a 12% decline in some major, major US cities, according to um, several studies. And um, compounding that, it actually um, reduces public transport usage in areas where the transit system is actually most mature um, and it's less popular in areas where there is less public transport. So, so there's a, so there's a, a, a reverse effect there, um, in fact. Um, and evidence also is that it draws publics away from free and, of course, sustainable forms of commuting like um, biking or, or walking to work. Um, in terms of e economic impacts, and um, I think Dr. Minming related to this as well, um, many of these providers have uh, quite a um, sullied record of data breaches and malfeasance and um, um, being taken to court many, many times by different corporations. Um, they also have a rich history of si sidestepping taxes, regulations um, and insurance. And for this reason, uh, many of these providers have been banned um, from many countries, unfortunately, from where I'm speaking and also um, Dr Ming Ming in Australia, um, it's not banned um, and so continues to have um, these negative impacts. Um, in terms of the red, as a reminder, this is the social impacts. So. Um, in terms of the unlevel uh, effects, it, um, Uber and these services actually attract high income share riders and disadvantages low income public transport users. It's actually been demonstrated that it's because of the traffic congestion effects, it actually increases commuter um, uh, travel times for people from low income areas. So, so not only is it privileging uh, a higher income class, but it's also disadvantaging um, low income people because of the um, unintended um, effects. Um, in terms of employment, um, we've heard of this term before, zero contract employees. Um, th this is, an, this is a, a, a negative impact in the employment space because it largely leaves um, people that contract um, to these car companies unprotected by industrial relations. Um, and I would also argue that it is creating a normative effect in tourism employment um, where other employers outside of the sharing economy are also embracing this zero contract um, employee mindset. So spillover effect. Um, it also has a handcuffing effect on contractors. So to, to, to enter the market, you need a car that's less than five years old, at least um, in terms of Uber. That can be a significant investment. And all of a sudden, people who invest are saddled uh, with this depre depreciating asset, as well as the other accessories that they need to, to operate. And, and one of the worst and unintended impacts was that it actually absolutely decimated taxi companies, um, at least here um, in Australia, taxi companies that supported sustainable employment and sustainable business ownership. I'll give you an illustration. In 2014, a taxi license in Brisbane on average was valued at half a million dollars. That is, people who invested in a taxi license and drove taxis for a living actually used it as their superannuation or retirement fund because they could they could sell that when they finished working. Um, in um, 2021, at the height of COVID, um, but not just because of COVID, but because the the entry of a lot of these um, a share ride um, platforms a taxi license sold for $3,000.
that's a value drop from half a million dollars to $3,000, huge negative impact um, in um, price. Um, So that's the travel side. I'd like to focus now on accommodation. Um, Airbnb and uh, a lot of these other share share, um, accommodation providers have been well documented as being significant contributors to over-tourism, and particularly over-tourism in um, high um, uh, high um, uh, yield destinations such as um, oh, I forget, uh, Dubrovnik, Barcelona, uh, Venice, Amsterdam, these sorts of places, um, and actually changed the character of these places because they've chased locals away um, uh, uh, because of Airbnb and ownership. Um, Dr. Mingming related to this too is because they don't participate in the official tourism statistics, the unavailability of the data obfuscates their um, actual environmental impacts. Um, And there's an indirect compounding effect um, due to their uh, lack of regulation. In terms of the economic effects, and, and, and our last presenter spoke about this as well, it creates housing shortages. Um, in the um, <clears throat> and, and rising rents. In several studies where there's a high saturation of, of Airbnb and a share economy, uh, a sharing economy accommodation providers, it's been shown that there's been between four and eight percent um, rises in um, rental increases. Um, it's um, also had an impact on property prices. In a New York study found that in a heavy density um, neighbourhoods, um, it increased property prices by uh, 10%. And that's actually changed real estate behaviours as well. Uh, Ming Ming referred to this. So um, a lot of um, investors are actually using um, the, the, um, the, the, the revenues that they generate through um, sharing economy um, accommodation on discretionary spending, but also there's some emerging evidence that they're also using the revenues to reinvest and grow their property portfolios. So it's actually changing behaviours. I want to focus on some emerging research that shows some really interesting social impacts. Um, a, a large study in the US <clears throat> showed that well over half of um, Airbnb hosts were women. And I'd like you to think about um, some of the roles that are typically associated with hosting. Involves cleaning, includes laundry, um, includes shopping, and it includes um um, emotional labour. So it's actually perpetuating this, this, these gendered labour divisions that we often find in hospitality and tourism employment. But ironically, it's actually the male hosts that, are, that generate the greatest profits. Um, so that again exacerbates those gender divisions. Um, Airbnb ownership also um, uh, reproduces um, class equali- um, inequalities. Um, An Icelandic (coughs) study shows that low-income households were uh, were hugely underrepresented when it came to um, Airbnb ownership. Um, um, Racism and exacerbated racial equalities are uh, um, are also evident as an outcome of of these sharing providers. Um, In black neighbourhoods in the US, 80% of Airbnb owners are actually white. Um, So that um, leads to a stripping away of resources and a concentration in in dominant um, racial um, um, elites and so on. Um, There's also an evidence of increased property crime, particularly um, motor car theft in in places where there's a high density density of um, Airbnb and, and shared economy ownership. Um, strong, ed- strong evidence of regulatory um, sidestepping. Um, I, I um, spoke before about Venice and Dubrovnik and, and destinations like that. 
Um, it's, it has a displacing effect on locals because they actually can't afford to live there. And so these destinations actually end up taking on an inauthentic characteristic because the people that live in these historic centres aren't actually the locals who, who add that human touch and that authenticity. Um, the evidence is um, mixed at this point in terms of the employment impacts. There are some studies that show that it has a positive impact on employment, but there are other studies that are showing um, that it's actually <clears throat> having negative employment impacts. A, um, an African study um, found that it reduced um, employment prospects um, in terms of permanent employment and made contingent or casual employment um, more prevalent. Um, and a recent study also shows that peer-to-peer -peer, um, accommodation generates uh, a little bit less than 10 jobs per 100 rooms, um, whereas hotels, the formal economy, generate 53 jobs per room. So there's some mixed impacts there, but as, um, as we've heard previously, research is vitally important to, to, to bring this to bear. Um, so the third pillar of the tourism industry, of course, is food service, and we're very familiar with some of the food service deliverers. Um, one of the huge sustainable negative impacts is waste generation and um, carbon, um, carbon impacts. Um, we know that um, the, there's a huge amount of packaging that goes into food delivery that's um, only ever used once. Um, brown paper bags, uh, which is a common um, uh, food delivery packaging um, receptacle, is actually more harmful to the environment than plastic. Um, during COVID, um, there was when there was a huge increase in food delivery services because people were in lockdown, there was a 20% increase in solid waste um, in, in Australia. So um, it's a bit hard to show a direct relationship there, but there's definitely um, a correlation. Um, the the bicycles, the motorbikes, um, even the um, even the cars that deliver food service are increasing um, traffic uh, congestion. So some negative environmental impacts. And um, we also know that they cannibalise restaurant share and profits. So just like some of the distribution systems uh, that now work for the accommodation sector. Um, uh, platforms like Uber Eats take 30% of the price of e a commission from the price of each um, each delivery, leaving a lot less for the for the restaurateurs, um, leaving them less capable to employ people um, that would otherwise work in the restaurant, um, and also seriously ch challenging their viability and their business model. Um, Dr. Ming, Ming Ming also alluded to the, the rather opaque algorithmic management and suggestions that they <clears throat> um, privilege um, certain, uh, that they act in sort of discriminatory ways because they profile both users and deliverers. Um, and we're actually unsure about the destinations of the data because many of the platforms that work in the sharing economy are actually less interested in the service. They're way more interested in the data that it generates, um, but we don't know where it goes and we don't know how it's used. In terms of the social impact, there are serious public health concerns with food delivery. Um, we know that there's a direct relationship between um, eating out of the home, which includes um, food delivery services and a high body mass index, or in other words, indicators of obesity. Um, we know that it affects consumers' uh, relationships with food because they, um, they uh, lose that sort of provenance and, and paddock to plate. Instead, um, everything's coming prepackaged and, and they're no longer aware of where it comes from and that has negative health impacts as well. Um, from an employment point of view, I've already spoken about the zero contracts um, and one of the negative consequences of that is that workers are deprived of um, industrial relations protections. Um, a food delivery rider was killed in a, in a road accident. There's been oh, about eight to ten uh, food delivery deaths in the last couple of years in Australia. Um, and um, 
the um, the family of the worker had to take the platform to court to get compensation for the family um, for his death because he he was not protected by um, his industrial relations law. Um, we also know that it provides a, a racial or ethnicized segregation of work. The vast majority of food delivery um, workers in Australia um, are actually um, migrants who are locked out of other other forms of work. Um, and, um, and, and arguably, um, these things add up to, um, to human rights abuses. The last thing that I haven't got on this <clears throat> slide is that it actually uh, displaces jobs. So, for, so because of the very high um, uh, commissions that restaurants pay, um, people who might be employed front of house um, uh, in um, in, in restaurants are no longer needed because they don't um, serve guests who might otherwise come to the restaurant and instead they're replaced um, by food delivery riders who are who are working for peace peace work essentially getting rewarded for work um so I've um, I, I realized that I've skipped through that um, really really quickly. Um, however, very open to, to question times. I wanted to finish the future agendas here um, by um, Airbnb's goal of a billion guests by 2028. Um, and I, I think that's a, a nice backdrop to reflecting on, on some of the um, data and some of the findings um, that I've shared with you today. So in terms of future agendas, much like Dr. Ming Ming, I think we need to bring to fore evidence-based research to, 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 to counterbalance uh, the very um, uh, positive and, and um, rhetoric um, surrounding the, um, the labour force. And also, I think as, as, as scholars, we are obliged to um, delve into to, to the whitewash here to uncover the negative impacts, but we're also um, obliged to actually bring forward solutions, policy implications, and so on. I think there's also a role for activism, for, for, for academics to, to showcase their research. Um, increasingly, um, in boycotting services, we can do that. I refuse to use Uber. I refuse to have um, home food delivery, um, but um, also on influencing how we might change um, consumer behaviours by making them more, more aware of negative impacts. Um, and, and we as consumers can use providers that embrace more sustainable practices across the three bands of environmental, social and, and economic. I think there needs to be some corporate bravery um, shown here as well. Um, it really tests the ethics of corporate partnerships. Um, I personally have raised this with the senior leadership team in my business school because we were recently invited to use Ubers instead of um, taxis because of a corporate partnership that University of Queensland has signed up and that prompted a lot of the, um, the research that I've shared with you today. Um, and, and there, there are actually firms that are doing this. So, for example, the Uniting Church, which um, is a not-for-profit with a strong social agenda, just announced yesterday um, that it has instructed its employees in several states in Australia um, to stop using um, uh, Uber because of concerns about their ethical practices and their sustainability um, track record. Um, and I think that corporations not only should make those brave decisions, but they should also publicly declare the reasons for making those decision makings so that it becomes part of the public narrative. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the legislation in this space has been quite reactive. Um, and the evidence is that um, uh, platforms tend to respond positively only when they're taken to court and in response to court decisions. And I suggest that legislation needs to be a, a lot more preemptive. Um, and that is that um, rather than looking at the disruptors always in a positive light, is to try and preempt some of those negative impacts, get on the front foot and, and put in place a, a legislation and policies to control that rather than be left with um, some of the negative impacts um, downstream. Um, so I guess um, in conclusion here, if, if we look overall at these three pillars of tourism, travel, 
um, food service and accommodation, and we match that up with um, sustainable tourism development. I hope what I've done today, and I think I'm very much in step with um, Dr. Mingming's presentation as well, I think we need to be careful not to be um, seduced by um, positive rhetorics or by the new and shiny. And we need to take a, a critical view of things and we need to um, um, and we need to be able to um, provide the evidence to put that forward in practice. I'll leave it up to you as to whether the sharing economy is a misnomer um, or indeed is a sharing economy. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Richard Robertson. It was a wonderful critical uh, aspect of a sharing economy. Of course, uh, actually, uh, as an individual, whenever we travel, we have to be responsible to understand what are the negative impacts actually, or those critical aspects and how we can avoid. And uh, we should uh, uh, pay more attention towards uh, the local community, the host community, and so on. Thank you so much for sharing uh, throughout the model of uh, those three major pillars of the tourism industry, uh, economic, uh, looking at the different impacts for the economic, environmental, and social aspect for those three uh, main pillars of tourism industry, travel, F&B, and accommodation. Thank you so much. We have a few questions which we'll be uh, uh, asking you at the end of the session. Uh, probably uh, I can introduce the third speaker, the last speaker of uh, this session, Dr. Stephanie. Dr. Stephanie, of course, so my colleague uh, at the School of Hospitality, Tourism and Events, uh, Dr. Stephanie Hui Venture, uh, is also an associate director at the Center for Research and Innovation in Tourism at Tulis University. Prior to that, she served as an assistant professor at the Department of Business administration in Asia University, Taiwan. Her research interests lie in artificial intelligence and robotics, sharing economy, technological uh, innovation, social media, and service marketing with an emphasis on hospitality and tourism management. Her research work has appeared in top tier journals, including Journal of Business Research, International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management, Journal of Hospitality Marketing and Management, Tourism Management Perspective, Internet Research, Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services, Computer and com computer and Human Behavior, among others. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stephanie. Floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Floor is yours. Let me share my screen. Please. So are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Jitesh, uh, for the introductions. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome to Second Secret Summer School. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephanie uh, Chua from Taylor University, Malaysia. So today I'll be talking about how to manage the dark side of the sharing economy for better sustainability and well-being. So this is the outline of my uh, presentations today. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, what is sharing economy? So according to the May Court, uh, the CEO and also the founders of Unbelt, uh, sharing economy sometimes we also refer it to as a good economy, collaborative economy and on-demand economy is actually not a new phenomenon. Okay. People have been sharing their goods, their services, and talents with the community for years. Okay. For example, the inventions uh, of the Free Cycle Network in 2003 has provided a platform from which people can give away the stuff uh, they don't want and also receive the stuff they want for free okay, in their own town. So in the same year, we also have a couch surfing. Uh, which facilitate the process of finding a uh, place to live with, uh, to finding the people to live with. Um, also, this, um, however, later, the companies such as Airbnb, Uber, and also Landing Club, they have uh, transformed this innovative idea into a viable and also profitable um, business initiative. And they rely on the technology to provide users 
gave it temporary access to tangible and intangible resources, uh, which are, are largely underutilized. So the tangible uh, resource here means like physical assets such as uh, office, the rooms, and also the vehicles, whereas the intangible is like uh, skill set, the talent. So according to the key WC 2020, so the share economy will grow from 15 billion in uh, 2014 to 335 billion in 2025. So uh, this is um how the uh, business model of sharing economy uh, look like. So they are based on triadic that rather than triadic exchange. So basically there are three main actors uh, in the sharing economy. So owners and seekers and the uh, online platform, they will connect the seeker to the owner and facilitate the, all the process between them. And an interesting fact is that the platform doesn't process any asset. For example, Airbnb doesn't own a single room, whereas the zip car doesn't own a car. So share economy emphasizes on a temporary access instead of permanent ownership. So basically, uh, there are two types of sharing economy, commercial, uh, which company they provide service to customers for profit, um, like Airbnb, Uber, whereas non-profit is like book, uh, book lending library. So uh, here are some examples for the sharing economy company. So for car sharing uh, in the US, we have Uber and Lyft, whereas in Southeast Asia, we have uh, Grab. So for home sharing, we have Airbnb and Home Away. So apart from room and home, we also can share the uh, uh, office space can also be shared and also the parking lot can also be shared. So the we work and impact the uh, hub offers such service. So, if we, uh, we also can share with talents and skill set through the uh, Amazon Mtra, uh, uh, Task Rabbit, and freelancer, and we also have the peer to peer uh lending and lending club and Prosper uh offer such service. So um, so the notions of the sharing economy is uh, aligned with the SDG goal um adopted by the United Nations. Okay, because uh sh sharing is leading the way to a more sustainable uh, society by encouraging people to consume less and collaborating more. So, so taking Uber as an example, okay, uh, Uber is committed to achieve the SDG goal um, through various actions. So the first is the economic empowerment. For example, uh, Uber, they have provided uh, earning a uh, opportunity to the drivers and also uh, delivery people and also merchants. And this, um, especially those from low-income family, and this uh, corresponds to the SDG 1, no property, and also SDG 8, which is decent work, and also economic growth. And um, all the while, we know that um, driver used to be a mere dominating job. Okay, but Uber, they pledge to create more jobs. Okay, they pledge to uh, reduce this gender equality by creating more jobs for women. So now we can easily see the female driver, uh, female Uber driver. So apart from that, um, in terms of sustainability, so Uber also help everyone to move and live uh, in environmentally friendly way. Okay, so they have a partner uh, they have partnered with the NGO and also environmental justice uh, organizations, and they help people to gain more affordable access to like green vehicle and also uh, charging infrastructure. And they also help to expedite a clean and also just uh, energy transitions. So um, in terms of safety, um, Uber, they have helped people to move safely. They have been working uh, to improve the safety of the platform uh, through the safety feature and also policy. So uh, nowadays, uh, all the Uber drives uh, can easily be tracked using, uh, using the GPS, okay, from the start until the end of the journey. So it can also detect unexpected long stop. Okay? So in terms of equity, they also um, work on uh, various uh, anti-racist and also uh, gentle equality uh, commitments, which help people to move beyond the bias system. 
and um, the notion of the um, shared economy also evolved around the three bottom line, okay, which consists of uh, society, economy, and also um, environment. So, um, however, there are some debate in the academic literature as to where as to uh, where the sharing economy is for or against the SDG and triple bottom line. So sharing economy is a business model which brings innovation and also sustainability together. So um, we call it as a business model innovations for sustainability. So, however, in the legal context, innovation is uh, something significant new. Okay, but however, they cannot be qualified as a legal concept due to its uh, disruptive nature. And the legitimacy of the legitimacy of the sharing economy has also been challenged because of the uh, its socially irresponsible business practice. However, currently there is a lack of a legal framework to regulate innovations and also protect the employee and also customer. So, in addition, the sustainability of the sharing economy is also questionable. So um, let me share with you some of the data of the sharing economy. The first is in terms of the uh, economic impact on service provider. So there are some argument whether uh, we should uh, uh, we should consider the gig worker as employee or independent uh, contractor. So in the US and also in Malaysia, they are con considered as a uh, independent contractor. Okay, whereas in the Amsterdam, they are considered as a uh, employee. So if you classify them as a, a contractor means that they don't have minimum wages and they don't have employment protections or insurance, um, they will receive employment contribution for their Medicare and also the social security. And they won't uh, receive uh, extra pay for working overtime. And sadly, uh, UberX, they try to compete with the leave in the US okay, by cutting it fair. However, they still take 20% of those earnings. And if you were Uber driver and you try to avoid short trip because it doesn't make money, so Uber will fire you, okay, for the low acceptance rate. So um, this picture shows that uh, the Uber and also the Lyft drivers across the US, they join a day long strike, okay, to protest the uh, protest for their poor working conditions. So the same also happened in Malaysia, where the uh, Red and also the Food Panda, okay, drivers, they go on strike to protest for the uh, low uh, neighboring uh, fees. So um, in terms of the economic impacts on third party, so, um, Airbnb, they try to shelter uh, their income from the local tax, okay? But they write to another company uh, in tax haven, such as Ireland, and they also try to, they also pay less uh, taxes. So, um, so Airbnb, uh, short-term rental, they will also increase the property price and also rental rate. And the advent of the Airbnb have uh, prone um, the landlord to quit the uh, long-term rental and for sales market, okay? Because the short-term business uh, tend to be more uh, lucrative. So according to the study by Barron's uh, 2020 across the US, they found that 1% increase in the Airbnb uh, listing will lead to 5.7 increase in the house price and also a uh, 3.2 increase in the rent, okay? So uh, the sharing economy, they also have adverse impact on the traditional taxing and also um, hotel industry. So in terms of the social and also the psychological impact, so sharing economy may create discriminate, uh, discriminations. Okay? So it has been found that some of the Airbnb guests, they uh, prefer and they, will, they are willing to pay more to stay in the home owned by white. So even making the black girls, they making 10.1% less than their white counterpart, counterpart for the equivalence listing. And if you try to apply Airbnb using the accommodation, okay, under the applicant's uh, 
American selling name, uh, the possibility for you to get rejected is 16.6%, okay? Compared to if you uh, use uh, white selling name. So as for the car and also ride sharing, okay, the ethnic minority passenger, okay, they also uh, have lower uh, encounter a uh, lower acceptance rate and they have to uh, wait longer to get the reply from the driver. So the second is uh, the safety and also privacy concerns. So in the US, uh, Uber is facing lawsuit from 550 passengers because of the sex assault. And it has been found that in the US, uh, most of the uh, Airbnb are not installed with the some basic basic uh safety e equipment such as carbon uh, monoxide detectors, fire distinguisher, and also first aid kits. Okay. Therefore, um, in December uh twenty thirteen, when a Canadian uh backpacker they visiting Taiwan, would die of carbon monoxide poisoning because of the leaking water heater and also poor ventilation. Okay in the Airbnb apartment okay, they ran. And another, uh, in addition, another survey conduct uh, reveals that 58% uh, of the Airbnb guests, okay, they are quite concerned about whether, um, whether their accommodation are fit with the hidden camera. And 11% uh, of them, they have been the victim of the uh, privacy uh, invading uh, creeps. So, so sharing a space and also drive with others, people make great discomfort, especially during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And also uh, if you pair with others, okay? So you don't know the, uh, uh, how long it will take you to reach your destinations and you have less privacy. So more often the uh, local resident, they also complain about the uh, excessive noise caused by the Airbnb gas, like they are throwing a loud party, drunken behavior, traffic congestions, and also garbage disposal um, problem. So um, in terms of the environmental uh, impact, so surprise so shelling might cause more car, okay? And more traffic because of the influx of the uh, tourists for the residents. So because more people, they want to buy a car to become the Uber or Grab driver. So uh, it will increase in the carbon monoxide uh, emissions. So um, a study by uh, Professor Change and other speakers, uh, they found that um, in the Australia, they found that the direct and indirect carbon footprint generated by the Airbnb uh, host and, and also platform uh, range from 7.27 uh, to 9.39 okay? uh, CO2 per room at night. So because the Airbnb host, they earn more. So their extra income will also lead to additional and induced carbon footprint. So here are some suggestions on how can we manage the dark side of the sharing economy. So uh, first of all, they need to establish a new and also flexible uh, legal uh, framework. Okay, so they cannot use the traditional framework. They regulate the traditional player. Okay, they have to regulate from an innovative law perspective. Okay, they also have to try, try to balance between regulation and innovations, and they need to encourage uh, innovation and also protect the interests of citizens. They need to protect the consumer fund the liability and fraud, okay? So uh, what is the consequence of uh, lacking uh, regulations? So this is uh, how the phenomenon of China bike sharing uh, graveyard, okay, look like because of lack of regulation. So it allowed more copycats, okay, uh, to enter to the market. So resulting in more uh, oversupply, okay? So many uh, share bike was left abandoned. So, so um, local government do need to develop a different uh, regulatory framework so to cater both the traditional and also the new player, okay, and encourage a more healthy competition among them. 
And another recommendation is that the they need to uh, the share economy player they can serve the niche markets. Okay, that traditional player do not. Uh, for example, the Airbnb they can partner with uh, UNESCO to provide a uh, cultural tourism, empower uh, the community and protest the heritage, Mexico heritage. So. Uh, the third recommendation is to improve the welfare of the gig worker. So especially during the lockdown, so as uh, those, especially those from low-income family, they are quite worried about the reduced income or losing the job. So this uh during this period, so gig economy opened another door for them. Okay. So they have to keep working, uh, keep working. Um, and also during the pandemic, okay, people uh will not opt for the, they uh, will avoid dining, okay? They will go for the, uh, they will call the food delivery. So the demand for the food delivery will be very increased. So um, because uh, the demand, so they have to keep working. So resulting in the uh, in South Korea, sporting delivery worker were death because of overwork during the pandemic. And also in the US, they complained that uh, Uber and also Lyft drivers, they complain that they receive minimum support okay, during the COVID-19. And also I think in the Airbnb uh, host in the Australia, they didn't receive any financial aids during the COVID-19. So um, the regulatory regulator, they also need to define the statutory tax okay, and also free structures for the app, uh, sharing economic players. Otherwise, it will put the traditional sellers at an unfair disadvantages. So um, moving on, um, the sharing economy have to uh, committed uh, to operate as a carbon-free company. For example, the Uber, they have committed to become a fully uh, electric zero emission platform by 2030 in the US, Canada and Europe. The same goes to Airbnb. They also commit to operate as a net zero company by 2030. So various approach has been uh, has been used to help the driver and host to switch to electric uh, renewables. For example, Uber, they have green uh, future program, whereas Airbnb, they have a, a renewables uh, energy program. So uh, Airbnb, they also, or Uber, they also have to work with the driver and also the host to educate them so that they become more um, eco-friendly. So they also have, uh, for customers, they have to encourage them to drive, uh, to ride or to stay green by incentivize them. So by, for example, by choosing Uber uh, Green, the customers, they can earn uh, two more points for each trip and redeem the work. Uh, the uh, sharing economy player, they also need to be more transparent about their climate impact for accountable improvement. So another uh, recommendation is try to build a partnership and nurturing the community. Okay? Uh, they can partner with the locals, governments, destination, marketing organization, and NGO to re uh, revive, the, revive the local uh, tourism. Okay? For example, in India, Airbnb, they have partnered with the uh, Maharashtra state governments uh, for homestay vacations to facilitate uh, travel in the lesser known uh, destinations, which will foster the uh, community led uh, tourism. So, this indirectly also help to fight the max tourism. So, in the Mexico, the Airbnb also have partnered with the WWF to stimulate sustainable uh, travels. So, and also through their partnership with the Fermato, Fermata, they can help to boost, um, boost the boost the economy of a micro and also small enterprise, okay? So the last one is cultivate a more caring and also a community oriented mindset. So at the end, it's not about sharing, but also caring. So because there's uh, without ownership, people won't take care of the goods. So we have to educate people uh, to take care of the shareable goods and be responsible, okay? Like park their, uh, bicycle in the design needs area. And we also, government also have to punish the consumer for their uncivilized behavior. 
such as uh, simply through the uh, rental by vandalism and also through embarking in Airbnb. And as for the commercial types of sharing economy, they need to balance okay, between the profit and also the social welfare. So they should avoid using sharing economy as a uh, marketing gimmick to disguise the profit motivation and as well patients okay, under the pretense of making a society a better place. So as a conclusion, so like any other uh, disruptive uh, innovations, sharing economy can have a positive and also negative impact on the SDG and triple bottom line. Uh, however, the dark side of the sharing economy shouldn't be an excuse to innovate because innovation is at the heart of SDG. And as Steve Jobs said, innovation is the ability to see the change as an opportunity, not as a threat. So um, because of the evidence of the sharing economy, such as Airbnb, so the existing player, the traditional players have forced them to up to the game. Okay? They have to think how to respond okay, to this innovative player by offering a more competitive offering and also provide better service. So in the end, it's not about finding a balance between innovation and regulations. Okay, uh, when regulate correctly, so I believe that the sharing economy can help to mitigate the negative impact of the marketing, um, of the market capitalization, capitalism, and reshape our uh, eco economy system. So if you want to uh learn more about the dark side of the sharing uh, of the Airbnb, uh, feel free to uh, read my cable. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie, uh, sharing the insightful details about the darks of uh, sharing economy. At the same time, uh, you also uh, managed to share that how those dark sides can be managed to uh, achieve the sustainability and well-being and uh, leading towards achieving the uh, 17 SDGs offered by UNWTO. So thank you so much. And uh, now please allow me to have a few questions. Actually, I have a number of questions, but uh, our time doesn't allow. Probably I can uh, have one to two questions to each speaker. So uh, the very first question to um, uh, I can offer to Prof. Ming Ming, uh, the question is, is being an Airbnb host part of risky gig economy, independent contractor with no benefit or safety nets? Um, uh, well, I think um, it's, <laughs> I think, it, it, oh, thank you very much for the question. Well, you know what I think, um, what do we forget is that Airbnb and Uber, though the sharing business models, they, really rely on like Airbnb hosts or Uber drivers. And lots of times, so all the responsibilities and the risk will pass from the platform to the Airbnb host. So when you engage with these businesses and you need to bear in mind what the risk involved. And if you want Airbnb to help you, like I demonstrated in my presentation, it's a very limited, probably no help at all. So I think when you, so what I would say is that if you put Airbnb um, as your set of business, so do not put all your eggs in one, but also you need to consider what the actual risk involved before you make that decision. Now, if you have a spare room, you not rely on that actual income. So that purpose will not affect you that much during the COVID. But if you rely on that actual room on Airbnb to pay for your rent, for you to stay, and that will become bigger concerns. So it's really about um, the risk involved in taking that into consideration. But one good thing is that Airbnb is coming back much quicker than we thought. So because, because one thing about Airbnb, if you're looking at the regional areas or in the, um, not in the city center, they become extremely popular because the people now tend to go outside of cities because they don't want to get COVID. So that's so that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's my answer. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, yes, I, I totally agree with you, actually, uh, that the risk is involved in every business, actually. But of course, there is, a as Dr. Stephanie mentioned in her presentation, there is a positive and negative pros and cons mm. of each and every business. So uh, 
when when I was listening your presentation that uh, uh, that can be an extra income or the secondary income we cannot rely on it or whenever we are investing also we always have uh, this common saying that don't put all the eggs in the same bucket we have to look at the different perspectives also so thank you yeah. so much for your uh, answer the second question uh, uh, let me place this question for uh, both speaker uh, dr richardson and uh, dr stephanie as well so given the rise of airbnb home stays or the farm stay how do you see the future of mainstream accommodation providers such as hotels dr richard uh, ladies first i'd like stephanie to respond if that's okay <laughs> oh, it's okay. So I will try to respond. Uh, I believe that the hotel, or the traditional hotel, and also um, Airbnb, okay, they have uh, they will cater different. Uh, they have different customer se uh, segments, okay. Especially for the uh, Airbnb, they want to uh, explore. They want to um, experience uh, live like local. They want to have a whole feeling, okay. Uh, so they will go for that like um live like culture so uh i think they were uh for cultural tourism okay but for customer uh, for the hotel customer um maybe they want to be served by um staff and also they look for more luxury uh, experience okay thank you dr stephanie or uh, dr richard would you like to uh, share your insightful um, yes, thank you. The second one was farm stay. What was the first experience in the question? Uh, let me repeat the question. Given the rise of Airbnb, home stays, farm stays. Uh, home stays, yeah. So how do you see the future of mainstream accommodation like hotels? Um, yes, thank you. That That's actually a great question. Um, I think uh, uh, without responding to that question directly, firstly, I think one of the positive impacts that the disruptors have had on tourism generally is that it has made um, the established businesses look more critically at their models, um, whether they are actually catering effectively to, to markets um, and, and particular cons uh, consumer and demographic needs. I think um, th there's an assumption in that question that um, that uh, the, the established or the primary um, sector in, in tourism and hospitality cannot provide farm stay and homestay experiences, um, but actually they can and actually they do because um, the, there are business models out there um, where they're able to do that. I, I guess um, the real challenge is, even if we support the, the disruptors, the platform economies, how can we do that in a way such that the local economies are, are protected, um, such that communities are protected, such that jobs are protected, such that there's a, there's a level playing field such that um, other stakeholders uh, in the economy and the community are, are not disadvantaged? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richard, for your answer. Uh, I have a one more question, actually. I can place this question, uh, uh, direct this question for both of the speaker, Dr. Richard, as well as uh, Dr. Ming Ming. The question is, what are your recommendations on how Airbnb carbon footprints can be controlled in the world where entrepreneurs are free to practice? Mm. Dr. Ming Ming, uh, probably would you like to share Oh, uh, probably re <laughs> Professor Richard has a better, <laughs> better idea than me. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'm not actually, uh, you know, I'm a workforce scholar, so, so it's not really in that space for me. But I would say something that um, I think all three of us touched on is that um, one of the big problems with the sharing uh, uh, economy at the moment is that the platforms actually sit outside of the regulated system and so data is not collected and so they don't um, uh, they're not regulated and they don't come under scrutiny. So the, the very first step is to make sure that they participate within regulatory frameworks. So there are transparent measurement systems. And, and once there are transparent measurement systems, 
um, and um, th they participate more fully in accreditations and, and standards and so on. Um, this is the key way um, to, to hold them accountable. And um, actually, uh, many of them would probably want to be um, more sustainable and leave less of a carbon footprint, um, but because they operate outside of a lot of these structures, they're not able to, even if they even if they want <laughs> to. But I, I do think this is part of Ming Ming's expertise as well. So I, I, I'm interested in uh, your views. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Well, I think when we talk about the carbon footprint of Airbnb, there's two challenges. Now, the first thing is that Airbnb does not share its data. Mm. We do not exactly know what's actually happened with individual Airbnb listings. Now, there's a first big question. Now, so what, what we did before for our research is to estimate based on the transaction data rather than real data. So there's a limitation. We only measure the lower end. And the second challenge of Airbnb is that Airbnb diversity is very hard to measure, even for accreditations, because you can have someone's house, you can have apartments, and it's very difficult to actually have a standard to measure. But in hotels, there were certain standards that can apply because a lot of hotel rules are standardized. Now, the last thing is that people's behavior are different in the Airbnb style accommodation. Now, we know some of them are like service apartment and some of them like more like someone's home. But if we will look at those holiday homes for Airbnb, for example, now, if your hotel is no one's home, you don't care, like, you know, you know how much energy, how much electri uh, electricity you spend, because a lot of people will think I already pay for that. I don't care because that's all. But if you're at home, you care about it because you're going to pay for the bill. But Airbnb is such a contest between your home and a commercial property. It's someone's home. So you will behave quite differently in that contest. You know, I'll give an example here. Now, if you, if you stay at a place, someone tell you, this is my home. I will love you to care as much as I do because I want to give you the best experience as, as, as you could have as a family member. And then your behavior can change, right? You will say, oh, look, this person is so nice. You know, give such a beautiful room. I really feel like it's my home. I need to save the electricity, uh, you know, clean the room to be more environmental friendly. So this is quite interesting, this particular contest, because we... Now, the first thing we don't know, but the second thing we don't know exactly what can make people to be more environmental friendly to reduce the carbon footprint. From our research, Airbnb probably can produce the same amount as hotels. But the reality is we don't have the actual transaction data. We're not 100% sure. The second thing, we don't know what factors will make people behave differently in that contest. Yeah, that's my thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and it was a wonderful and extensive answer actually i totally uh, agree with your concern that everyone you if you are individual or you are a stakeholder or institution everyone has to play their own role being a responsible uh, to achieve uh, sdgs achieve to get the sustainability in their businesses by applying green practices and so on uh, well we have a number of questions probably we cannot take a any more question uh, after this because we have already reached 7 40 pm and uh, probably these questions can be shared uh, uh, with the speakers later and uh, i think this is a time for session summary just allow me few more minutes to summarize the session with the, all the three great speakers have uh, shared on uh, sharing economy and sustainable tourism development Starting from the Dr. Ming Meng shared on the sharing economy business model by using wonderful examples of Airbnb and Uber and mentioned about the importance and impact of sharing economy leading towards the United Nations sustainable goals. Okay, I'm going to take this example also one of the most important thing that it is necessary to think that risk is involved everywhere and we shouldn't put all the eggs in the same bucket. We should think, rethink once more. 
Dr. Richard discussed about the critical perspective and technological enabled sharing economy and its impact environmental, economic, as well as social on all the three key tourism dimension, including travel, accommodation, and food services. Also, he shared on sustainability impact, sustainable impact that, that the sharing economy has or had across the tourism dimension. Whereas the last speaker of this uh, session, uh, Dr. Stephanie enlightened us on the emergence of sharing economy and transformation of traditional business model to the new on-demand business model. She also insists the, that this paradigm shift is assured by technology-enabled platform that provides users with temporary access to tangible and intangible resources. Also, she confirmed that sharing economy is often associated with positive societal outcomes such as a more efficient utilization of IELTS services, more flexible employment option, enhance social interaction, reduce overconsumption and pollution. So I'm sure uh, like me, all the audience, every one of us have enjoyed the session and they are they, uh, they have taken the notes of uh, uh, of this particular session, this particular theme, sharing economy and tourism development. Thank you so much. Uh, now we came to the Thank end of this uh, particular uh, session. I give the floor to Dr. Rupam or Dr. Kandapan. 